Let's talk about cyber triage. Just a quick note before we begin, this is not a sponsored episode. I was provided with a license so that I could evaluate this software, but I was under no obligation to create a 13 cubed episode covering this content. I chose to do so because I think it's actually going to be very beneficial to many of you watching this. So with that out of the way, what does cyber triage even do? Well, it provides automated incident response capability. It runs on all versions of Windows, XP, and newer. It utilizes a collection tool that can be pushed to endpoints or it can be manually run on an endpoint from a USB drive or other removable media. Doing either requires no installation on the target, but it can also just process an EO1 or raw disk image or a memory capture utilizing volatility on the back end. These last two points, the disk images and memory captures, are what we're actually going to take a look at in the live demo coming up next. It was created by Brian Carrier, author of File System Forensic Analysis, and of course, Autopsy and TSK. So plenty of street cred here. This is not created by some sort of fly-by-night forensics company. What does it collect? Well, it collects volatile data, including running processes, open ports, logged in users, active network connection, DNS cache. Also malware persistence mechanisms, including startup items and scheduled tasks. User activity, including what programs were run, web activity, logins, file metadata from all files on the system, and even file content from suspicious files. So maybe I should have said, what does it not collect, right? How does it work? Well, if you actually use the option to push it to an endpoint or run the tool from a USB drive on an endpoint, then you have this collection tool that flags any suspicious data and you have an automated analysis process that goes through and just basically looks for things that are known evil or possibly evil. And then it's up to you as the analyst to determine whether or not those things warrant further investigation. How much does it cost? Well, here's the cool thing. There's actually a light version that's completely free. And as you can see from the capabilities, it allows you to collect volatile and file system data. You can even collect data to a USB drive, analyze memory images, pivot through the collected data to determine scope, view timelines, and generate reports. So a lot of stuff for free. Now, of course, there are some commercial versions like standard and team that you see here. I'm evaluating the standard version, but again, the light free version still provides plenty of forensic value. So with that out of the way, let's talk about the demo. We're going to analyze an EO1 image from a Windows 10 box and then check out the results. Then we'll analyze a memory capture from a Windows 10 box and review those results. So let's go ahead and hop over to a Windows 10 analysis workstation and get started. All right, we're in our Windows 10 analysis VM and we'll go ahead and launch cyber triage and take a look at the options available to us. First off though, you'll notice this warning saying that no NSRL file has been configured. We'll come back to that in a minute. Let's go ahead and choose no for now. We can choose new session, open session or open incident but first, let's check out the options option. This will provide a list of options used by the software. The first being the National Software Reference Library or NSRL, which is a national database of software. Now, of course, we're going to leave that unset for now. And then the PS exec settings is what will allow cyber triage to push itself to a remote host. We'll leave that blank as well. We are going to change the time zone to UTC, however, because that is the only time zone you should be using for forensic analysis. Under network settings, we can set a proxy. Under malware settings, we can clear cache and save results from previous scans. Deployment mode is just single user basic deployment for this demo. Whitelist, of course, is a list of known good. Blacklist is a list of known bad stuff. Dynamic DNS is a list of the DDNS providers the software knows about and the license info contains information about the license, go figure. Let's go ahead and choose OK, and we're going to choose the new session option. And now we have five options. Live automatic means that cyber triage will push the collection tool to a remote host. Live manual means the collection tool is manually run from a network or USB drive on the remote host. And then live file means the same, except the data is saved to the USB drive or to a network share and manually imported. We're going to be taking a look at the last two, disk image and memory image. 
First up though, disk image. This will allow us to point to an EO1 or raw disk image. Let's go ahead and choose demo for our incident name. We'll type in localhost for the host name. And now let's browse for an EO1 file we're going to use for this first part of the demo. I happen to have a Windows 10 full disk image that's about 15 gigs in size, and there you see it. So let's go ahead and choose that. When we do, it populates the source file in the field, and now we'll simply click continue. For the full scan, which is what we're going to be using, you'll notice everything is checked except some of the volatile data, which is used in the memory portion. And then we can also choose a custom scan or skip file scan. Again, we're going to use a full scan. Find all the things that you can find, in other words. Let's go ahead and choose continue. And at this point, we have the option to query external services to get malware results. Now the radio button is set to upload the file so it can be analyzed, but for OPSEC purposes, you may want to go ahead and just tell it to mark the file as suspicious, but not upload it, which I would recommend in most cases. So having selected that, I click start collection. We can expand the status here, but after a few seconds, what's going to happen is you're going to see the full screen window appear. Of course, it tells us the NSRL database was not specified, so we'll click OK. And now we're off to the races. Of course, I have greatly sped this up. It's going to take a variable amount of time. We do see the Windows Defender firewall prompt. Let's go ahead and tell it to allow access so that Cyber Triage can go ahead and do its thing and run some queries to determine whether or not it finds any evil. And you'll notice the suspicious item count is growing fairly rapidly. So we have at the end of the scan, 47 suspicious items. And as you can see, all 10 steps have completed and no tasks are currently running. We have zero high threats in this case. And again, 47 suspicious. So let's go ahead and take a look at the left column here. Under bad items, again, we have none, but we have 47 suspicious items. And it's very self-explanatory. You can see them there on the left, what it thinks are threats. And in this case, some of these are indeed blacklisted password dumping tools, as you can see, and other that it may have flagged as interesting or possibly suspicious because they're running out of app data local. Here we see the users present within this disk image, which is handy. We see some login information with a couple of IP addresses here. If we click on one of these, you'll notice more information. You can see that this is an outgoing connection. You'll notice the local user involved, the remote host IP address, remote user, and various other information. This is from the ntuser.dat registry key under terminal server client servers. We have network shares here, which are enumerated from the image. Again, very useful. Programs run, so think things like prefetch, where we can determine exactly what has executed on the system. And if you notice that scroll bar on the right side, there's a lot of stuff here, as you would expect. As we scroll down through here, we can kind of get an idea of exactly what was being run on this Windows 10 system. So quite a bit of useful information under Programs Run. Under Web Artifacts, we don't really have anything to show in this demo. Under Startup Items, we do have quite a few things, though. This is going to, of course, enumerate the good old run key and numerous other locations from which programs can start automatically on our Windows systems. Quite a few things here we would need to look at, but according to this, there's only one suspicious item. Under triggered tasks, again, quite a few things, one of which is flagged because of the location from which it's running. No processes, because that's gonna come from memory, right? We don't have that information here. Same with active connections not connected or not collected rather from a disk image. Listening ports, same. DNS cache, nothing here. Registry keys, no suspicious entries found. Under files, we do have a few things that it did flag. For whatever reason, it flagged USB detective, which is absolutely not evil. Under timeline, it's actually built a rudimentary timeline for us, showing us timestamps in UTC. And under system configuration, we get some information about the system configuration from that particular system from which this disk image was acquired. So again, I just breeze through that because it's very self-explanatory. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by explaining what each of those things are, because I think you'll agree it's very easy to figure out what's going on here. It's almost to the point of click a button and find evil. So obviously you do have to perform some analysis, but still very easy. 
Now let's go ahead and make another new session, this time though for the memory image. So for our incident name, let's choose demo2 because I can't think of anything better to type here. Under host name, we'll go ahead and type in localhost again. And for our source file, we're going to go ahead and browse to a memory capture I happen to have, which is named after the correct profile that we're going to be using. In this case, you'll notice the name actually is from Windows 10 build 17134. So under the volatility profile dropdown, I'm going to go ahead and choose Windows 10 x64 build 17134. So that'll save us some time. We won't have to run image info or KDVG scan on the back end to try to determine which profile volatility should use. We'll click continue here. And as you can see, some things are unchecked because they're not really applicable to a memory image, but we can choose a custom scan here. Again, a lot of things are grayed out because they're not applicable. We could choose network processes, uh, programs run, startup items, and that's really about it. If we go back, however, to the skip file scan, you'll notice it's pretty much exactly what's been chosen there. So I'm going to go ahead and just use skip file scan and just stick with the default options really and click start collection. And as you might imagine, this tool is simply running volatility on the back end automatically and aggregating the results for us. We'll go ahead and click past this dialogue as before. And again, I'm going to greatly speed this up. You'll notice here though, it's running PS list, get SIDS, malfind, various other volatility plugins we've talked about numerous times in other introduction to memory forensics episodes. So at this point it is complete. And this time you'll notice we have a critical error message where a requested registry key that volatility tried to enumerate user assist in this case was not found. That's okay. Remember there's no guarantees in memory forensics. Some stuff may be there. It may not be there. So, don't freak out if you see an error message here and there as the memory image is trying to be enumerated. Notice the rudimentary timeline on the right side for a suspicious bunch of SVC host processes. And notice we have a bunch of bad items this time, eight in total, whereas we had none in the disk image. And you'll notice it flagged explorer and svchost.exe, which is always a favorite for malware authors. So clicking on any one of these will provide more detail as always, but particularly I would focus in on the SVC host.exes and I can tell you in this memory image, there's definitely some wonky stuff going on with SVC host. Check out that path below the highlighted area there. You'll notice windows SVC host.exe. Well, that's not the right path for SVC host.exe for sure. We can click on all these other tabs though, to get additional information and as before, it's very self-explanatory. You'll notice user account related information and details, just pretty much anything that was able to be enumerated from the various volatility plugins that were run. We have execution history. We have information about startup items, various things like that. Of course, I can expand any of the columns here so it fits, but again, uh, startup items, nothing here, sessions, nothing here, and our analysis results, as you can see, the score is bad, the confidence is high, and the software is correct. This is evil. Again, clearly evil, especially because of the name and path of that SVC host.exe and posture process. But clicking on any one of these will give us more details below, and we can scroll through and click on any of these. Very self-explanatory, very easy and user-friendly. So for suspicious items, we have 10 things here that were flagged for various reasons. Again, some of these are in fact evil. So looking at this one, we have notepad, we have smartscreen.exe, which is interesting because it's often flagged by malfind as it was in the description, as you can see here. And that is actually a false positive that malfind reports on every time. So interesting there, you can ignore that one. For users, we have the users that was able to enumerate from the memory image, CTF being one of the main users. If we scroll down through here and start clicking on all of these various things, here's some network share related information, which could be potentially useful to us. And as you can see, we have a C colon path here under Windows System 32 WBIM. We have programs run, again, program execution artifacts that were able to be derived from memory. 
which is very cool. Things we've talked about in previous Memory Forensics episodes. No web artifacts. A few startup items, one of which is flagged as suspicious. No triggered tasks. Here is an awesome output of a tree-based list of our processes, which I really, really like this. So very, very easy, kind of like PS Tree, if you will, but we have a GUI version of it where we can go in and look at the parent-child relationships and find anything that might be uh, suspicious or bad. You'll notice the icons, like this one, for example, says bad. And again, that's another one of our evil svchost.exe processes in this image. And as we continue to scroll down through this, you'll notice, again, the yellow and the red icons, which represent the suspicious or bad items, respectively. For active connections, we actually do have some things here that we can expand. See a bunch of remote IP addresses here that we might want to take a look at, all on 80 and 443. Some of these could, for example, be C2. Listening ports might be of interest to us. We see a bunch of SVC host.exe with the dash K options here, which are probably legit. But again, we would want to look through this stuff and verify. DNS cache, registry entries, nothing here of interest, same with files. Here's a timeline that it built for us based on time-based artifacts out of our memory image, all in UTC. Very cool that it makes a timeline for us and very useful information here about process creation, ports that are opened, things that are run, active connections, very useful information. And for system configuration, as before, it's pulled some things out of the memory image, most of which we already knew but still very interesting information overall. So that's cyber triage. We looked at a disk image and we looked at a memory image. And as you can see, it's almost to the point of point and click forensics. You guys have heard me say this over and over and over again. I am not one to believe that you should just put software in front of a person with no forensics knowledge and have them click buttons and make assumptions about what has happened on a particular system. In other words, I saw this thing called prefetch and it says here that that means something ran. So clearly something ran on this system at this time. Well, while that may be true, if the analyst looking at it doesn't really understand the underlying meaning of any of these artifacts, that may not be so good. So I would recommend at least a basic understanding of what these forensic artifacts are before you go just click a button and have a tool output a bunch of stuff for you that you're expected to know what it is. You can't just click the solve case button and expect everything to be happy. That said, this software goes a long way to provide what I like to call a 30,000 foot view. It's basically a very high level view that we can derive very quickly by simply opening a beautifully designed and really pretty GUI, clicking the browse button, clicking on a disk image, or a memory image as we just saw, and basically saying, show me some stuff here that may be evil and let me figure it out. There are different flavors of the tool available and you can certainly download a free version and actually play around with it. And even the commercial versions are very competitively priced compared to other commercial tools that I've seen in this space. So I hope you found this information useful and I hope you will check this out. But that's it for now. So as always, thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. And I will catch you in the next episode.